Hey everyone, I know it's right after lunch and welcome to our talk, who this the right way to authenticate. To start off, who are we? I'm Lakshmi Sudhir and she is Divya. Hey everyone. <laughs> so uh, we do all things application security. We work with, uh, we work uh, to do like secure software development cycle to be involved in the secure software development cycle and all stages. We work with a lot of developers, we work for them so that we can go ahead and ship secure products. Uh, we had one more colleague we want to give a shout out to, it's Narayan Gauraj. He worked with us on this project, but unfortunately he couldn't be here today. I assure you he's alive. <laughs> we have not done anything to him or this project doesn't kill anybody. So um, before we head on to the presentation itself, just a quick note, all of this research is based on publicly available data. There's nothing that has been taken from a company or anything like that. That's something that's accessible to everyone. Also, one more call out is we are not advocating that you use anything that's inherently insecure. But as you, most of you know, in the real world, there are cases where even if you have a really strong protocol as such, there might be a part of its uh, inherently insecure component that you would have to go ahead and implement. In those cases, we are just trying to make sure that uh, we, we just found a couple of like secure ways of doing it, and that is what we are talking about today. We are not advocating using anything inherently insecure. Now that we're done with all our disclaimers, let's start with what is this talk about? What's the agenda for today? So today, we're going to talk about the background itself as to why are we here talking about this. And talking more about the problem statement, like it's 2019 and we still have to talk about authentication. So we're going to get into more details about why is this a problem statement itself and more details about the issues itself. Then we're going to try to touch upon some of the remediations and try to understand the patterns across authentication itself and various protocols. And then we can have some time for questions and answers. So what is authentication? When we think of authentication, the first thing that comes to mind is identity. Now, how do these two piece together? Identity is who you are. Authentication is what verifies, the, verifies your identity. It says that if I'm Lakshmi, that's authentication is how I verify I'm Lakshmi. And we think of a lot of, there are a bunch of protocols that have been built, bunch of technologies, bunch of platforms that we use to establish authentication itself. But they inherently lie on three basic principles. One is for me to establish my identity. It could be something that I know. That could be a secret, a token, or just when I'm trying to try to get money and cash to gamble out here in Vegas since I'm here, I had to use my pin. So that is something I knew. And then possession. Possession is more around UV keys. You could have a mobile device. You could have something else uh, that is a physical uh, entity or something that only you possess, such that you could establish your identity. The third part is something uh, that you inherently are. I open my phone, it's my face ID, I use my touch ID, that's something who I am. That's something that's unique. And that's how I establish my identity itself. So authentication, in short, for be it a user, service, anything to do with it, is based on three broad things. Knowledge, possession, and inherence. So where does authentication come into play? It could be as a user when you're trying to access an application or an application talking to the backend. With user authentication, some of the common things we spoke about was Face ID, uh, a couple of like, uh, what else did I talk about? Yeah, YubiKey, password, secrets, and all of that. But when we had to actually put together this presentation and look for all the data, we logged into an application. That was the user, user authentication aspect of it. And then these, this application spoke to multiple other applications out there. And those applications to pull out like some of these authentication issues, for example, and they had to access their database, pull out all these reports they have, consolidate it and return it to the service. The service consolidated it, fed into a BI tool to make it like more presentable, make it into all these fancy graphs such that we understand and we can ingest the data. And with each of these communications, all the services had to identify to one another to make sure that it is the right service it's talking to. So there's so much out there in the ecosystem 
making authentication a very important aspect. It's more of the backbone when you begin communication in this whole complex ecosystem. With AWS and other cloud instances out there and cloud services, everything is almost reduced to a web service per se. So authentication has become more and more important as we have progressed in this ecosystem. Now, why are we here? Is there a problem? Of course, yes, no surprises there. And that's why we are here today to talk about this and we are all here to discuss and see how can we make this better. If you're still not convinced and a skeptic like me, we have some data for you. So as most of you know, OWASP, uh, amongst the OWASP top 10, even during the latest revision, the top second one right after XXE, I mean XXE, uh, sorry, cross-site scripting, XSS. So uh, right after cross-site scripting was broken authentication. With SAML, OAuth, Kerberos, we have a million authentication systems out there. It's pretty surprising that this is still on the top. So we took a little deeper into this, and this was the point of inception where we were like, this is a HackerOne report for bounties that were paid out by companies. Companies have spent so much money on it, and this came to a close second. Broken authentication or improper authentication was something that companies had spent a lot of money of the bounty on. That was, again, the second highest after cross-site scripting. This was a point where we were like, this shouldn't have been a problem really after so long. Why is it still a problem? I mean, we didn't want to remember a lot of passwords. It was hard to have complex passwords and remember all these passwords in various applications. That's why we came into single sign-on, we had OAuth, we created multiple systems and multiple protocols. And it still stands there on the top. So this was where we felt that this requires some research. We really want to work on this because this is an actual problem. We want to address it one way or another. And this is how our talk got, uh, I mean, this was the inception point for our talk itself. Now, there are furthermore details we pulled up, like uh, some of the reports which were high risk, and that's something that further motivated us. So Divya is going to talk a little bit about that. Do you know? OK. Hopefully, you can hear me now. No. All right. So um, once we had the inception point of uh, that HackerOne report, like the second most uh, problematic area was broken authentication, obviously, the reigning king is cross-site scripting. So we kind of went into uh, the past year, what are all the OAuth issues, or at least the general authentication issues that have been reported. And one of those, like, this one, even seeing the report kind of pulled me in because like, this is a social login scenario which is supposed to be secure, but still inherently during implementation, something went wrong. Similarly, you have stealing OAuth tokens via redirect URI. And again, a similar one, insufficient OAuth callback validation, again, pointing back to redirect URI. And finally, um, authorization token not expiring after logout. Now, this is not inherently um, like an OAuth issue or even uh, like a specific authentication scheme or a protocol issue. It's just general that ties back to the token. So what you are seeing in the screen right now is just cherry-picked um, like issues that we saw, and we kind of dove deeper to do our own case studies. But we saw multiple issues, not just limited to this. And that kind of led to, like, is it a common issue across protocols? Is it a common issue across schemes? Is there like one protocol that's going to be like, I'm going to solve all your problems regardless of implementation? It's good to dream about it, but it's not the reality. So yeah, this is what we researched on. Yeah. So uh, as Divya said, after this, we thought we should come up with an approach to address this and understand if there's some common patterns and themes. So we started off going over the top 100 websites, and we're like, hey, what are the most commonly used authentication protocols? And how do we classify them? Amongst these protocols, we identified a couple of protocols, and then we were like, hey, what are the high-risk issues? What's the worst thing that could go wrong? And so that we could focus on these uh, high ROI issues, and then we dug into what could be your remediation? What is the best case scenario for remediation? Because most best practices, for the most part, are sometimes not really applicable, actually most times not applicable in a business scenario. So how do we go about maybe having difference in depth or just outline some of the remediations that may work, that has worked for us personally when we were talking to developers and maybe that's something that we could share. And also I think the primary idea I feel is that as security engineers we owe a responsibility to guide our developers towards the right way and the most secure way. That's what our job is. So uh, we felt that we need to make this usable and understandable for the developers themselves. 
So uh, this is the approach, and for today's talk, we are going to focus on uh, four of these. We are going to talk initially about the JSON Web Tokens, the JWTs or JOTs, and then we are going to focus a little bit on OAuth, uh, passwordless and magic links, and then we are going to talk a little bit about SAML as well. And in our conclusion, we want to draw out like what are the common patterns and how do we go about why? Why is authentication such a big problem even today? So let's start with a JSON web token or JOT. Now, what is a token in general? Token is just an identifier which is used to authenticate. That is what is validated by an application. You present your token, it's like, hey, this is a valid token. I mean, this is a valid user. This is Lakshmi, and it's her token, so let me provide the service. But JSON Web Tokens, it's nothing but a JSON encoded representation of a couple of claims which is digitally signed such that you have some key value pairs. And uh, this provides authentication because when you submit this token itself, the uh, application that's receiving this can actually go validate the signature. And you have this JSON body which has something called claims, which is nothing but you could have scopes, you could have the user ID. Instead of a single session identifier which has a unique number or a random token, you use this which is a JSON body and it is digitally signed. So we use both asymmetric and symmetric algorithms to uh, perform this digital signing itself. So let's, let's just look at a scenario. Now, as a user, I sign into some uh, application using Facebook or uh, any of the social authentication systems. Then the authentication server validates my username, password, or uh, any the primary uh, authentication part. And then it provides a JSON web token back to the user. Now, this JSON web token, we're going to dive uh, deeper into the structure of it and more details on that. Now, when this user presents this token to an application server, the server actually validates, uh, it has this been tampered with, and it validates the signature itself, and then services based on whether this user should have server access to uh, the application server or not, and uh, processes the HTTP request that was being sent there. It could happen again between service to service as well. So there are two components. Uh, this could be used as a session object as well as between service to service for service to service authentication. Now, why would you want to use JOTS instead of a session identifier? That's because, one, it provides authentication through integrity. Again, uh, I want to call out that this is just base64 encoded, so there's no confidentiality, but there is integrity uh, because there is a signature to the body and the header. So you get authentication. You can also add some information around authorization, saying, hey, this user has scope, because it's a key value pair at the end of the day with JSON. So that way, it's easier to share that information, which makes it stateless. Now, with session identifier, you would have to store like uh, the identifier, the unique identifier on your backend, and also store like the user ID or any associated primary key out there. With this, it makes it stateless. All the ser application server has to do is, as soon as it uh, gets a service request, it looks into the signature, it validates the signature, it's great, there is the scope information. So it makes it amazingly stateless. That makes it scalable as well. Compared to session tokens, it's compact. You could say it's compact and lightweight because mostly JSON key values are pretty compact. Uh, of course, it depends on how much you put uh, into the payload of this, but it's pretty compact for the most part. And again, coming back to the point of the key value pair uh, in the JSON body, uh, you could have information exchange. So this could be useful, let's say, in cases of like OAuth, where you have a token issue or an authorization server that's giving tokens in your multiple applications. That way, it's more scalable with different applications when you're using JWTs. You could even information, uh, exchange information in this payload part of it, uh, saying, hey, this person has scoped to this application, this application, or even send out some usual information around user ID or a GUID or more on those lines. So as I said, with all of these properties, where is the use of JWTs, which is pretty common? It's used in OAuth. It's used in OpenID Connect. In OAuth, it could be used as an access token, refresh token. And in uh, OpenID Connect, it's used as an identity code token. And some applications also use it just as session objects itself. The structure of a JOT. So the three parts to, to a JWT, uh, one is the header. The, the one you see on the left here, the header, payload, and signature, is what is being passed. So it is a base64 URL encoded uh, string that gets submitted to your application. So uh, this header is what contains. Now, when you decode this, this is what you see. For the header component, you see the algorithm that's been used 
to actually create the signature. Again, uh, you could use symmetric as well as asymmetric uh, algorithms to actually get this, uh, create the digital signature. With symmetric, I think the challenge is more around like sharing secrets across the other parties that have to validate this. So asymmetric is something that's pretty common because you could, of course, rely upon the public-private uh, key architecture, you could, I uh, mean, infrastructure. So that way, even if you're a token issuer, all you have to have uh, as an application or a client application is just have the public key so you could validate this. So the header contains the algorithm, and the type is JWT because we're talking about JWT tokens. There are other kinds of tokens, which is out of scope for this talk. And uh, the payload is where the meat of this is. This is where you can have like, hey, this is the user. Is he an admin? Is he not an admin? You could also have more information around like, what time was this issued at? When, uh, who is the token issuer? When does this expire? And all the information out there. So this is what is the main thing that is, that has made it more attractive for the developer community to use JOTS instead of a session identifier. So uh, this is where you have all the details. And the signature is where the header and the payload are hashed. I mean, it's, they're, they're digitally signed. And this is the part that a server validates when a JOT is submitted uh, during a service request. Now that we know that this is the structure, let's move on and see if this is a valid JOT. Show of hands if any of you think this is a valid one, valid chart. OK, awesome. You're all right. The way you're biasing them. <laughs> so awesome. You guys are right, actually. So even though here we saw that there is a signature component and there is a value for the algorithm itself, we see that the algorithm value here is none and there is no signature. Unfortunately, uh, not unfortunately, there might be a there is a business case for the non algorithm, but when you're using this as a session object or to establish session or identity as such, this is something that most uh, implementations have missed is verifying that the algorithm is not none. Because when this JOT is submitted to a service, it looks into the algorithm to see, hey, was this using a symmetric algorithm or an asymmetric? What was the algorithm used? When it looks at none, the inherent behavior is to not look at the signature and then just process the JOT. As an attacker, I can create any number of tokens out there and just provide it to a service with the NUN algorithm. The whole point of authentication is lost here. There's authentication bypass, and I have complete control over anybody's account. So uh, this is one of the most common issues that have, has been there from 2015. I think 2014-ish was the inception of uh, JWTs. And this was discovered in 2015. And still, there are libraries which uh, support this. So how do we go about remediating or making sure that we take one, we take notice of this? And the second one, how do we go about remediating this? So again, like I said, there's a best case scenario. There's an OK, uh, I mean, like something we could do with. In that case, programmatic controls, of course, are the best way to go with any uh, validation as such. So one of the things you could do is you could make sure that, let's say you're using HMAC256 here, you could make sure it's hard-coded that any token comes in, you use the same algorithm, you try to validate it. But that may not be possible in a very real-world scenario, because there'll be multiple algorithms that uh, uh, authorization server or the application server may support, the token issuer may support. So in that case, one of the Oh, uh, the next best uh, approach could be to have a whitelist of all these algorithms that the server supports and make sure that you are validating against just one of those and you do not accept none or something that is inherently cryptographically weak. So these are some of the approaches. These are like the two approaches that could be taken. And the other thing, of course, is to choose the right library. Since we have libraries, we have these protocols, we have these technologies that do most of the heavy lifting, I feel like we should leverage some of it. JWT.io is a good website to go to. They have like for each of your tech stack, based on your tech stack and based on the library you're planning to adapt, you could make sure to go through that uh, to see what does it support, what doesn't it handle. That way, even when you're implementing it, you're aware that, hey, this doesn't check for an algorithm. So maybe I should implement this check myself or leverage something that already exists here. So uh, I think that holds true for any any application per se, I mean, any technology per se that use the right library and identify. So with with respect to JOTS, it's good to look for the NUN algorithm and go about verifying it. Now we've checked the NUN algorithm. We are doing great with the validation. We are making sure that we check for the right algorithms. What else could go wrong? So let's say uh, here, OK, we are talking about a cool company then. OK, this is a cool company, by the way. And the attacker is Joe. The Joe has, uh, Joe has access only to the mail server. 
we have a token issuer out there, so Joe submits his credentials and he's like, hey, this is great, I am Joe, which is right, he's not an attacker yet. And he gets this token from a token issuer and give, provides it to the mail service itself. The mail service validates, we've checked for the non algorithm, we've checked for the right algorithms, so it's all cryptographically strong, making all those assumptions here. Uh, it services to Joe with whatever request he does out there. Now, Joe wants to make more money. He wants to attack the finance service. All he does is submits this token. It is a valid token because even the financial service utilizes the same common authorization server. So he could just replay this token itself and provide it to finance. Now, if finance doesn't have the check, if the client application in this case doesn't have the check of validating if this user actually has access to this service, then again, it fails as an authentication mechanism. The user can bypass his authentication. It is a valid token, but the user does not have authorization. So it's not enough if we have controls just to validate it, but validating with context of what we are using this for is something that's important. Some of the mitigations that could be used is uh, JOT uh, RFC provides you with a uh, predefined claim called OAUD, which is not short form for audience. So you could use that to explicitly say that, hey, this user, we need to make use of the JSON payload. I mean, that's why we moved to chart. So something you could use that for is to have this audience parameter and have like uh, this a user has access only to database. You could also use the issuer to make sure that, hey, this user or anyone who accesses finance service might have a different issuer. So to make sure that you are looking for the cool company issuer and this database itself, you could make use of both of these components. But audience, I think, has a higher hold in this case for a mitigation from a mitigation standpoint. Obviously, you could have some extra checks around scope as well, because just checking for audience may mean that this person has write access or just read access, and you may need to have more of that. And you could, again, move this to the JOT itself to handle all of this, because you know that if it gets tampered, you have a way to identify. So uh, this could be one of the mitigations for this. And now that we've handled all of these validation scopes and all of that, how do you handle a logout scenario? So tokens are short-lived. That's great. But we don't have a cache of all of these tokens like we have the session identifiers. So if you're using a session uh, this to establish session, um, if a token has a 4R, for example, for the sake of this conversation, it has a 4R window out there, then it is still valid even if, as a user, I log in and log out. How do you handle that? Now, one way of, I mean, the ideal way of handling this right now is to have, like, uh, you could use the JTI claim, which is nothing but you have a unique identifier in simple words on every JSON token. You maintain a backend uh, copy of this saying, hey, this is identifier. And every time a user logs out, you can go th um, put it into a revocation list. And all your client applications can actually, or would have to use it too, right? Because the token is still valid because it's not expired. So in this case, you would have to maintain state. And you do lose it not being stateless anymore because you have to maintain a state to handle these revocations itself. So you would have to have a list of valid, uh, invalid identifiers and make sure even your client applications have this. It's not enough if just the authorization server has it, especially in the case of an asymmetric uh, algorithm scenario where you have the public key. So that is something that is to be taken care of definitely if you want to handle sessions. This is one of the most common issues we've seen in a lot of places. So this is something I feel is a key call out anytime anyone comes to you and says, hey, we want to use JOTS to, uh, to manage sessions. Also, having, of course, a short TTL always helps. But again, it comes between usability and security. So if we have to make those compromises, then it's better to have this in place. So that way, we have things controlled for pretty much most of it. Uh, also, it is quite challenging with uh, actually, um, I mean, revoking for a particular device or a particular user as such, because again, that would add more on your backend to be controlled. So that's to do with revocation. Now, we've handled revocation, but there, it would come to key management at some point. There are two scenarios. One could be a breach scenario where you have a key on your authorization server or the token issuer that got leaked. How do you go about rotating it? If you rotate all the keys itself, it's a global logout, and all the jobs would uh, become invalid. But one way of approaching it could be, again, using one of the things that uh, JOTS uh, RFC itself provides, which is the key identification claim, which could be used 
to mark like let's say you use a particular you use a bunch of keys it's usually like a bunch of keys that every authorization server uses so you could identify which key was the one that was compromised and just rotate it for that particular key in case of a server compromise and i think it's an accepted thing that if you force a change in any signing keys then every jot would be invalid so these are some of the hassles that come along with uh, using jots while there are a great set of advantages these are some things to keep in mind and to be handled uh, when you are implementing or using jot so what are the key takeaways here? One is definitely validate your algorithm uh, claim out there in the header. Make sure to look for what you're using and make sure not to allow any cryptographically insecure algorithms. And the other part is to validate all claims. Make use of what is there in the RFC instead of like creating your own because that needs to be vetted again. So this is something that could do the heavy lifting for like revocation or like key management and identifying the audience, managing to make sure that you don't have authorization bypass. Also, I couldn't tell this enough, please handle revocation carefully. We are also trying to identify everywhere this job. We're like, let's talk about revocation and then go back to all the nitty gritty details because this is something where most applications haven't been doing a great job. So uh, I think this is something that definitely requires a huge call out and something to look for maybe when next time you're looking at an application. So next we're gonna talk about OAuth. Divya, do you wanna take the stage? Hello. Everyone doing good so far? This is the half point? Awesome. OK, so next we are moving on to open authentication or open authorization. I'm just going to call it a what. So OK, a brief primer on what exactly is uh, OAuth. It has three entities. It has the client, which could be a device. It could be a user. It could be something acting on behalf of the user, which is sending a request to access any resource from a resource owner. The third entity, which is the authorization server, verifies the client and forwards the verification information to the resource server. So the way the handshake works is client says, hey man, I want to access something from the resource server. And then the client, meanwhile, parallelly can initiate, hey man, can you please provide me something to authenticate myself with the authorization server so that I can forward the same to the resource owner so that they can give me back the resource. Same way, in the background, the resource owner has a list of is this client OK to access this particular resource? Are the set of clients OK to access this particular resource? And the way that is handled in both the authorization server and the resource server is between them. It changes according to implementation, but usually they make sure that they have a whitelisted client, either at runtime or statically, they can access the resource. That's the OAuth primer. Moving on, oh yeah, sorry. So there are three kinds of tokens here. Um, so there is access token, there is a refresh token, and then there is authorization code, which I'm still going to group it under a token. So authorization code is nothing but it's like a binding token or a code that is given to the client during the registration time. So this is like a one-time setup that happens between the client and the authorization server. And then in return, they are given a client ID and a client secret and an authorization code. Now, depending on the implementation, a subset of these secrets might be held on with the client, and some might be, some or all of them will be held on with the authorization server, depending on what level of confidential information both of them want to hold on to. But the other two, which are frequently seen in traffic, are the access tokens, which are the short lived tokens, which are being sent with every resource request or with every other, um, every other special kind of request that goes to the authorization server. The other one which you have is the refresh token, which is the long-lived token. If you run out of access tokens, or if you run out of, say, your initial login expiry, or whatever session that you have maintained between the client and the authorization server, that's when the client pulls up the refresh token and, hey, like, hey, I got this refresh token when I registered with you. I want to get a new set of access tokens that I can supply. So these are the three kinds of tokens to reiterate, access token, refresh token, and auth code. Now, Irrespective of whatever token that you got, as long as you have the token with you, like as long as the client has this token, you are in. You get to access the resource, you get to communicate with the authorization server, and if there are multiple services on the back end that are going to use the same token to communicate, you get access to all of them. However, how do you know that that token belongs to that particular client? So it works in a trusted end-to-end -end system where you can guarantee best practices were followed in every entity that was involved in that particular workflow. But 
I'm pretty sure we all know how, like, how much of a chance there is, of course, in Utopia. But in reality, it may be lost, it may be stolen, it may be intercepted, proxied, um, what is it, relayed or altered. I was pretty stoked to see there were so many verbs used to what can happen with the token. And all of these have been seen um, in publicly disclosed reports. So yeah, what do you do to prevent this? And I'm using the word prevent here very loosely because this is a mitigation effort. It doesn't remove the risk completely. So what can you do? You serve the tokens over TLS, and you have short TTLs. And again, what is short? Five minutes will be short. A minute will be short. Some people might think six months is short. Some people have thought one year is short. So what exactly does it mean by short TTLs? So why, so you understand that having transport like over using TLS or having shorter TTLs is definitely not enough. So what do you do? Token binding. So um, this has been um, getting a lot of fraction. So what it, this does in very simple terms is you already have the token. You already have the infrastructure that is set up for the client and the authorization server and the resource owner to communicate with tokens. This is not disturbing that. This is just adding on to something that is inherently generated and known by the client and also mutually shared with the authorization server. So what happens is the client generates a key pair. And this is somehow, during one of the negotiation calls, the authorization is also aware of. So with every subsequent call that goes out, there is something, there is a certificate or there is a key that is sent along with the token that binds the client to the secret that they are sending over to the authorization server. So the client server negotiation that happens in token binding is both of them agree on a couple of metadata that is going to be shared between them. One of them is the token binding ID. This is basically another UUID that is generated by the client. Well, again, depending on the implementation, it could be generated by the client, it could be generated by the server. But the end game is both of them know about it. And the second one is the signature scheme. Like, what signature scheme are both of them agreeing on? What is the payload signed, like, going to be signed by? And there are other metadata that is available for extensions and for binding type. But for the purposes of this presentation, we are focusing on uh, token binding ID and signature scheme. So what exactly happens? Like, what is token binding in action? So there is one, like the initial uh, like TLS call happens, client hello, server hello, hey man, hey man. And then finally, both of them have like identified each other. And then there is another specific call just for initiating and securing the access token and the refresh token traffic that's going to go on, which is called the sec token binding. So sec token binding is the header that is passed along um, every post call that is made. And this payload is essentially uh, containing the signed EKMI, which is the export key parameter, or export key material. And this export key material is nothing but the key that the client has already made uh, the authorization server aware of. And then something like uh, a signing message, like this is the client who has been authorized to communicate with this authorization server. The assumption here is that it's not easily predictable because it's still going to be part of the payload. It's something unique between the client and the server, or family of clients and server, but that becomes part of the payload. Um, right now, there is API support for um, from web servers because the web servers or the browsers are going to be handling um, the client calls for the client, but more on browsers later. So for now, um, the servers that um, support this are Nginx, Apache. And from a language point of view, there is uh, Java 8 and 10 support that is available. All the developers need to do is just, there are ready-made libraries available for OAuth itself. And they can just, and it comes with token binding support. On the other hand, if they want to be adventurous, they can extend whatever TLS library that they are using. And if that is the case, and if you are the one who is reviewing it, make sure that the metadata is unique enough and whether they are using all the metadata properly. Because again, there are things that could go wrong with that. Uh, did I cover it? Yeah. So basically, the payload uh, looks like the sec token binding header that is being sent from client to authorization server. On the authorization server end, it checks whether the payload contains uh, whatever was already agreed upon. So even if there is another client who has hijacked the token itself, they do not have this uh, binding information with the client who actually negotiated it. 
So with every subsequent call that goes out, um, say either um, providing a refresh token, providing an access token, or using the access token, then you basically concatenate the token binding ID. Or if you want to go all out, you can just, just uh, just send the payload again and again. But in the authorization server end, what you're looking at is the binding ID. Like, is it coming from the client who registered the binding ID with me? So I briefly commented on browser support. So right now, I understand that Chrome doesn't support it. Uh, there's only Microsoft Edge that supports it. So obviously, this is not going to happen without the user knowing, or it's not going to happen automatically without giving pain to the developer. So here's where there is something called self-signed certificate, mutual TLS, and all of this that comes into picture. Self-signed certificates are not something alien. These, these have been existing for a long time. So it's just repurposed for the um, OAuth workflow. So what happens here is the client now sends a self-signed certificate to the authorization server. And again, this, there is always a negotiation call that happens. So the client sends whatever information, whatever certificate that belongs to them, and that bounds them to what they are, to the authorization server. And the authorization server, on their end, register that. Obviously, this is going to add one another attack vector, where there's going to be a database entry of the binding ID and of all like major secrets or concatenated secrets that they have with the client. But I mean, you need the context for subsequent workflows. Um, and in subsequent workflows, what happens is uh, the access token is then concatenated with the client certificate. And then this is being sent off to the authorization server. And then now they can see that the, it's, just, it's just not the access token that is coming in. It's also the certificate that identifies the client. So why is um, PK Pixie great? Um, people aware of Pixie, raise your hands. OK, so Pixie is a proof of key ex code exchange. Uh, what it basically does is whatever I explained so far, just substitute your certificates and just substitute your key pair with a code verifier. So during the negotiation call, what happens is the client is going to send like, hey, I have a unique code, and this is how I generated it. So I'm going to give you the generated code or some form of code challenge, and I'm going to give you the TM, which is the transformation method. So the authorization endpoint now knows what to expect and how to derive the secret from that, because it knows the transformation method. Now, for every subsequent call, the access token is appended with the code verifier. So like the most foobar case would be a malicious client. Otherwise, you need to overtake every workflow that happened with the authorization endpoint. Just getting the access token doesn't work. Just getting the code verifier doesn't work. You need to basically mirror every workflow that happens. So yeah, that's Pixie. Uh, right now, it's mostly used by mobile workflows because the limitations of storing client secrets on the device. But again, storing client secrets anywhere is kind of a bad idea. So if you want to use Pixie, you might as well go for it. So all like uh, the, co the token binding and Pixie, all of them were to do with uh, inherent weaknesses or implementation weaknesses with token binding or with tokens. Now, moving on to open redirect, uh, which was what showed up in three of the HackerOne reports that I showed. Uh, so open redirect, this case interested me because of how simple it was to execute. Uh, so this one was uh, manipulated redirection URI via the redirect URI parameter. So basically what happened was the authorization server didn't have um, a static redirection URI registered with it um, when the initial registration was happening. And the client was basically passing a redirect URI through the referral header. And what had happened was, in the referral header, the URI was passed with an extra percentage. And that kind of screwed up the validation mechanism uh, at the authorization server end. So yeah, it was one percentage mark that was sent along with the URI that was passed on. To mitigate this, uh, what you can do is um, people not familiar with this meme, uh, the first one is um, like the minimum security measure that you can take, which is if you are in a position where again usability versus security, we need more, we need to support more clients and we need to make it secure. In that way, you let the burden on the client. You extend your trust boundary beyond 
your authorization server or your resource server, you include by default the client in the trust boundary. Uh, if you're wondering it's a bad idea, that's why I started off with that. So um, basically, you leave the client to authenticate where the token is going to pass, uh, going to be passed to. So if you have a list of re redirect URIs, um, then say a.com to b.com, then a.com needs to verify that b.com is legit, and then forwards it to authorization server in their referral header. Like, hey, it's okay to pass uh, the token in, like the token to b.com. The second best way to do this is during the registration phase, the client says that, hey, I have a list of 10, 20, 100 um, redirect URIs, and you can whitelist all of them, and I'm going to maintain the whitelist uh, with you. And once a call comes in where you have to pass on the token, please, uh, please check against the whitelist and then forward the token. This has some issues because all developers, like they need to maintain a robust whitelist, and they need to make sure that the uh, like the list, like the websites are maintained, where the URLs are maintained, and then people might complain, like, "Hey, man, this is becoming an availability issue. Like, we need to onboard someone like within two days, and we can't get to the authorization server." Then, there are pain points to this. Uh, the third part, which is actually advocated in the RFCs and the best practices, like any documentation that you will find, is to have one static redirect URI, and every token goes there. And obviously, this endpoint is going to be part of your trust boundary. And you leave it up to the trust boundary to like forward the token wherever they want to. So, but from an authorization server perspective, they can do a string by string match, like an absolute match. So there is no way that within the OAuth scope, the token isn't getting leaked anywhere. So yeah, those, at least in our opinion, in all the uh, issues that we have seen so far, uh, token and redirect URI seem to be most easy to go wrong and like the best practices that could be followed to kind of prevent it. Moving on uh, next to magic links. So I wanted to bring up magic links because it's been like creating such a buzz lately. So um, basically it's the authorization server or the authorization system doesn't have the burden of storing secrets. And to an extent, the client also now doesn't need to store secrets. So in a, in a nutshell, the workflow that happens is the client wants to log into a website. The authorization server behind the website says that, hey, this person wants to log in. So rather than uh, looking for credentials that the client could provide, they generate a credential or a secret that is passed on to something known about the user. Now, this might be a phone number or uh, an email where uh, a generated secret is then passed on to uh, either an email or a phone number. And then the user is expected ideally within a time frame to click on this uh, code or to verify this code and then get back and they will be given a login session. Now, these are technically supposed to be short-lived secrets, but there have been cases where they don't expire at all. Um, and this is supposed to be a secure transport, but depending on the email service provider, depending on the phone network provider, it's basically shifting blame. You assume there is security on third party, like other integrations that store the secrets for you. Uh, yeah, like I said, email and phone network security dictates the risk. So before the magic happens, uh, these are all the kind of uh, things to make sure that the developers take care of in their code. And this is before the magic happens. So this is even before the secret is sent out to the email or the phone uh, phone number. So the first one is please make sure that the user, like either the phone number is verified or the email is verified. A lot of the times the implementation do not take that verified email or phone number. So make sure you do that. Uh, the next part is when you're generating the token, make sure that it has high entropy. And make sure that you're using something, uh, some established protocol. Um, and I'm, I've given the example of JOT here because we have talked about it. Uh, so make sure that you have an issued for, that there is an intended recipient. And you also make sure that you're using the correct algorithm. So please make sure they're they are not using MD5. And uh, yeah, again, token binding, again. Uh, make sure that whatever you're sending, whatever secret you're sending to either a phone number or an email, make sure that you track who requested it, where it is being sent, and where the response is coming from. And for this, you need to make sure, either you can store the secret on its own, but you are getting the burden again anyway. So you can store a part of the secret to verify that uh, what you sent out in the request or uh, what, was, uh, what came back in the response. Uh, make sure that you have that contextual binding information. 
Last but not the least, make sure that you have rate limiting enabled. Uh, it's very easy to overwhelm when there is something generating secrets, uh, and it could be easily used for enumeration. So make sure that you have a rate limit for where the request is coming from, and make sure that the client, uh, like you have a legitimate number of times when a user forgets that they clicked the link already. So yeah. A uh, quick note, quick note on SAML here. Um, so we just like brought in SAML as well because we wanted to see. The issues that we saw in JAR and OAuth, are we able to see something here as well? So just a little bit of metadata about uh, SAML. It's basically XML data consisting of uh, signatures and assertions. And again, this is something negotiated between the client and the authorization server, and they know what's going on. But in the case of SAML, there is an increased amount of metadata that goes on. So you have like user ID, which is the basis of author authorization. And then you also give like user attributes, like first name, last name, organization, and other things that you want, especially in a single sign-on scenario. Yeah, one complaint is that it's too verbose. It's not a simple payload that you can pass in the header. Or you could, but then it's probably going to trip up some load balancers. But yeah. Uh, so one security issue is, again, because we spoke about signatures already, one of the things is digital signature attacks. Um, one, missing signatures. The client and the server negotiated that, hey, you are going uh, to send us signatures, but then time of use, time of check, the authorization server doesn't check if a signature was passed along. Signature wrapping attacks. It could be a legit signature that is being passed on, MITM, somebody else decides to wrap the, the payload containing the signature with their own signature, and then whatever, is, uh, whatever token is returned is now returned to them. Um, and then you have cloning signatures. Uh, self sign assertions is super interesting because you basically send the payload, which contains the key as well. So the server looks to what was sent in the payload, payload to verify the, the certificate. So it doesn't check with whatever it has in its own database. It checks it against what was sent in the payload. This is happening. So um, yeah, and the other one, which is the XML passing issue, where the data that is being sent is, again, like I said, negotiated. The authorization server knows what the client is going to send, or at least the format of what it's going to send. This is a really cool way of gaming the format, where the legit um, text here expected is the admin at example.com. But then the way that it is split is there is a text fake, if you see the right hand side. And then at the bottom, you have admin, admin at example.com. Now, what the server sees, it doesn't have enough context to even parse that XML data that it's going to see text fake and then reject it. But then it's going to come down and read text admin at example.com, and it's going to allow it. But overall, what it gives the token to is fake admin at example.com. So again, there is context that is getting mixed, uh, missed between the services that are communicating with each other. Again, like authorization bypass. So yeah, that was SAML. And in conclusion, what we saw was across JOT, OAuth, SAML, and passwordless, we have seen different developers implement different protocols. But then it's the new protocol, and it's again the same problems that we are seeing. When we are in a position to advise developers or work with developers to have a secure implementation of authentication, we see that we, con we continually advise them on, have you managed token metadata properly? Have you chosen the right algorithm? Are you sure that the server is doing validation at each and every point? Is it doing validation across the right data? And finally, there is missing context in all of them. So there is always security entities that are involved in the protocol, but then it's never bound to like what entity we are verifying. So in conclusion, there are many ways to authenticate, equal or more ways to implement authentication incorrectly. And we did this presentation to understand if we could come up with secure practices across authentication protocols, not just context-based, that they can take care of if they are going to be implementing something. So empowering developers to securely implement authentication is definitely important. Uh, so questions? <laughs>